everybody. Um, um, thank you so much, actually, for inviting me here today. Um, I'm going to be the moderator, but the, the man of the hour is Professor um, Kai Asheimer, a professor in, of German politics and uh, political sociology at uh, the University of Mainz in Germany. And um, Kai has published um, widely on voting behavior, electoral behavior, uh, and has a particularly uh, focus on voting behavior of, of uh, the radical right in Europe. Um, if you don't know him, he's widely uh, published and very well known uh, in the studies of far right, populist right, extreme right, and so on and so forth. Um, so super stoked to be here myself and listen to this lecture. Um, I'm not going to take any longer in terms of introducing Kai. I'm just going to remind you just to be yourself muted during the lecture and uh, enjoy. Uh, looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Kai. Yes, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I hope you can see my screen now. Is that is that right? Yes, perfectly. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. So I'm going to talk about populism and crises, and I was told it should be a short lecture, so I will try to take up not too much of your time. Um, basically, I'm addressing three points. First, I'm um, trying to develop a sort of framework for looking at populism and crises, and then I'll turn to populism as a consequence of crisis. And finally, I'll finish with crisis as a consequence of populism. And last but not least, I'll try to summarize and present a very short outlook of what I'm going to tell you now. Let's start with some sort of conceptual framework. Um, interest in populism ex is exploding. Uh, I mean, the large number of people in this virtual room is, is testament to the growing interest of populism and in a bit to gauge this interest and interest i ran a keyword search for populism on the social science citation index which is basically a database of the most important scientific journals in all the social sciences selected for their high reputation and looking back um until 19 56, I found round about 6,000 articles published in these journals doing um, populism studies of sorts. But if you look at the distribution of this, um, these articles over time, you see um, that populism studies really took off in the early 2000s. And right now, uh, we're living in the age of peak, peak populism studies. So um, around about 800 studies are published every year just in these very top tier journals. Um, this slight decline here in 2022 and 23 is not really a decline. This is just the database catching up um, with the enormous output uh, being poured into this field of populism studies. Everything seems to be about populism right now. Um, and you can see that there is really a largely interdisciplinary interest in this field. But if you look a little bit closer, um, you can, for instance, see that round about um, half of these articles have been published in political science and international relations, which you could argue is, is just a subdiscipline of political science. And then there's also a large chunk in sociology, in communication studies, even in economics uh, and in area studies. Now it gets very... Um, very fine grain. So you, you see that there are smaller fields in adjacent disciplines, uh, but most of the research is indeed taking place in political science, sociology, communication sciences. Um, word of warning before we start, it's already a very crowded field. Um, so competition is quite, quite fierce. Um, every PhD student in the world now seems to be interested in adding to this already large body of research on populism. And that makes it very difficult for you um, to find good research questions that work for you, uh, that are connected to a subtopic that is interesting to you and that has not already been done to death by others. Um, and there is also a problem because the field is becoming so large that people are sometimes repeating stuff that we have already covered in the past two or three decades ago that gets forgotten along the way. 
uh, and is then rehashed by a new generation of researchers who could probably uh, make better use of that time. Having said that, it's also a terribly interesting field. It's very contemporary in a sense, because um, what you're doing in this field is trying to make sense of, of political developments and social and economic developments that are happening right now um, at the moment. And your research has the potential to affect, I wouldn't say the course of history, but at least you have a chance of informing policymakers and other stakeholders in this uh, rapidly developing field of, of politics, actually. So um, before we get there, uh, I'm afraid we need to start with definitions um, in the plural, because without a clear definition, um, populism is really just another buzzword, something that attracts a lot of interest, but without a clear idea um, of what we're talking about, there is a clear and present danger of talking past each other. Um, and so I had a look for you at uh, common definitions and found that sometimes populism is seen as a communication style or political strategy. Um, others argue that populism has become institutionalized and it's now basically a system of government. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, some argue that populism is basically a personality trait, uh, a tendency to respond to politics in a certain way. And there are many, many more definitions. But what really dominates um, current research, at least in political science, and I think also in um, at least quantitative sociology, is this idea um, that populism is an ideology. So this is why this approach is sometimes called the ideational approach, because uh, here researchers argue that populism is about a certain political ideology that is in itself quite empty. And uh, because of this emptiness, populism needs to attach itself to some host ideologies. And these host ideologies can, can vary. Um, but what is at the core of populism in this view is the belief that politics is all about a fundamental conflict that can't really be resolved uh, because it, it really structures politics in this view. And this conflict is between, on the one hand, a corrupt elite and, on the other hand, the pure, um, the common people. The important thing uh, about this idea of populism is that essentially it ignores all the diversity in the world. So, of course, there are members of various elites in all societies, uh, but in a populist view, this elite is completely homogeneous. It's um, a, a closed, small class of people. And in the same way, the pure people, um, the true citizens of the state, they're also perceived as very homogeneous. So um, in, in the populist worldview, this conflict between the elite and the people dominates all other conflicts within the larger citizenry. So um, there, there is no recognition of the existence and the legitimacy of social groups uh, no recognition of, let's say, conflicts between ethnicity um, and gender and whatever else makes you human and might um, affect your view of politics. This is all ignored um, or deemed irrelevant by populist actors. Um, another final element that has come to the fore more recently in this um dichotomy between the elites and the pure people is the existence of some external other. Um, I think that goes back to work by Albert Hatzi and MacDonald um, from around about a decade ago, where they identified a, third, uh, a sort of third actor um, that makes a triangle of this conflict. Um, and this external other is represented by the elites. That sounds that sounds all very, very abstract and confusing. But to give you an example, um, migrants, for instance, that would be a prime example for this external other. So it's another group uh, which is different from us, the people, 
and there's a sort of shady alliance going on between the corrupt elite and this external other that is brought into our life and into our politics. So that's the core um, of this view of populism that was developed uh, most prominently, I think, by Karl Mudde. Uh, but there are also other, oh, he's so prominent that he appears twice um, up on the slide. That's coincidence. Um, Mudde, but also Margaret Canavan in the 1990s and more recently, Ben Stanley. An empty ideology that needs some sort of host ideology, and that could be a leftist, a centrist, or uh, a rightist ideology. Having covered um, my ideas of, rather not my ideas, but very prominent ideas of what populism is all about, um, let's turn to a definition of what constitutes a political crisis. And this is, in fact, uh, much more difficult to get by. I found this wonderful quote. Undoubtedly, the concept of crisis is rather vague and diffuse. Um, and this is not from today's op-ed in The Guardian or from some recent political science article. Uh, it's from Svensson, and it goes back to the 1980s. So around about 40 years ago, Svensson already recognized the need for a clear um, definition of what constitutes a political crisis. And the answer he gave in this article uh, was that a crisis is an elementary threat to the political system and to the elites running the system. Again, the elites crop up here. Um, that could lead to a transformation or breakdown of the political system. So a pretty, pretty serious um, threat to the existing order. But this definition implies that only after the fact, after the crisis has occurred and perhaps transformed the political system, we can really be sure um, that we have been dealing with a crisis. This is not very practical. It's also different from our everyday usage of, of crisis um, because it implies a sudden change, a sudden threat or challenge to the political system, whereas we seem to live um, in a, a decade or perhaps even a century of crises in the plural that come but never seem to go away. Um, that's the one point at which this definition differs from our everyday understanding of what constitutes a crisis, uh, but also it does not consider the internal perspective of citizens or other political actors, um, whereas we believe or Think, like to think of populism being connected to this pervading sense or feeling of crisis. Um, this, this doesn't come at all into this definition by Svensson because he has the perspective or he has his eyes on the political system itself, not on us political actors or the citizens or the elites or whatever. So I think I think uh, for addressing this double question um, about the relationship between populism and crises, uh, it makes sense to use a slightly broader definition. And on the slide, there is a proposal that I came up with um, where I would argue that any sort of, of real or even imagine, imagined political, cultural or economic development, political situation, economic turn of events um, can be framed by populist actors as a threat to the pure people, um, to the true citizens of the state, to the good people, to the ordinary people, and, and can be linked to something that external others or the elites have either actively done or have permitted to happen by um, inaction on, on their behalf. So, um, this is, I think, more in line with what we have in mind when we talk about populism and crisis. Any sort of development that can be framed as a threat, not necessarily to the system, which might be questionable from a populist point of view, uh, but rather a threat to the people. The implication of this um, view of things is that populists rely up to a point or at least benefit from such perceptions of crises. Uh, and the populists have real incentive first to frame political events in a way 
that foments this feeling of crisis. And second, they may, may even have an incentive to manufacture crises, to actively um, take decisions that lead to a crisis. And so um, there again, we can link back to this system's perspective on political crises. So in, in both sense, in the more narrow system-focused sense of the word, in the broader um, citizen-centered uh, citizen sense of the word, um, there is clearly a link between populists and crisis. Which brings me to the second part of my lecture, uh, populism as a consequence of multiple crises. And because it's the afternoon, we're all getting a bit tired. I'm trying to do this with tangible examples. Um, the first of my three examples concerns the financial or euro crisis and the Great Recession. Um, that goes back around about 15 years, and seeing your young and fresh faces, um, please forgive me if um, if I'm repeating stuff that is completely obvious to you, but for the sake of this argument, let's go back in time 15 years, uh, back to the financial crisis that really started in the United States um, with a tendency of large and not so large banks to create rather obscure financial products that did basically nothing but hide highly problematic loans that had been given out by these banks that became became then um, tradable, uh, that could be exchanged amongst banks. And this whole system uh, began to unravel in 2007, leading to um, the decline of uh, Lehman Brothers, one of the biggest banks in the world, and then um, other banks in their wake. And finally, um, arriving in the real economy and leading to a global recession, to rising unemployment in many countries, to a string of very costly bank bailouts by the public purse um, that then created ripple effects across across the globe. And um, one of this, these ripple effects was that um, a number of European banks, mostly French and German banks, but not exclusively so, were exposed uh, to increasing risks from holding government debt in poorer Eurozone states, uh, most famously, I think, Greece, but also Cyprus, Portugal, Ireland, um, even Italy and Spain were affected. And so this um, banking crisis in the US that started in 2007 had become a Eurozone crisis by 2009, and this crisis lasted well into the early 2010s and required the bailout of private banks with public money and large-scale intervention by the European Central Bank, by the European Commission and the International Monetary Fund, the so-called Troika. And that was made conditional on massive cuts to social spending in those countries affected by the debt crisis. Um, that's one part of the story. And uh, another slightly less well-known part of the story is that um, money became very cheap. Central bank money became very cheap in the Eurozone. And this allowed North European countries like Germany, but also Denmark and the Netherlands to borrow money very cheaply. Um, to restructure their existing debt and made them effectively winners of this great recession, whereas there were really deep cuts um, into the economy, into the welfare state, in those chiefly southern European states. Um, a massive financial crisis, the biggest in living memory, certainly. And the political consequences of um, this crisis were also global. Um, things happened on a global scale, uh, most notably perhaps the rise of a worldwide movement uh, that brought inequality and the need for regulation back on the agenda after um, around about 20, 20 plus years of free market and neoliberal reforms in Europe, but also in other countries on around the globe. Um, so that came back to the forefront. Um, politically speaking, it led to the rise of far left and arguably populist parties in Greece, uh, but also in Spain and perhaps even in, in Italy, though I'm, I'm not quite sure what to make um, of the five stars. But you could probably argue that that was also partly 
um, a left-wing populist movement that became a party. Um, more generally, it led to a polarization in European politics, pitting uh, the proverbial lazy Greeks against the greedy Germans, north versus south, um, east versus west within the European Union. It led to a lot of bad blood between countries and people. Looking back um, at this very tumultuous period in European politics, it would, however, seem that there was very little systemic change. So um, these far-left movements had, certainly had a political impact, but they do not dominate the politics of these countries. Rather, um, they have declined, or the importance and influence has declined more, more recently. Um, so the populist radical left, if you wish, was not able to make a lot of long-term political gains from all this. This is different um, from my second example, the second crisis that I would like to have a look at, and that's the so-called refugee or asylum crisis of 2015 and beyond. Um, what happened in 2015 is that the civil war in Syria, which was already quite bad, became a lot worse. Um, so did other conflicts. And so uh, a large number of refugees tried to get to Europe and contributed to the already rather high numbers of asylum seekers and refugees um, in the European Union. And in the summer of 2015, large groups passed through the Balkans and got stuck in Hungary, which led in turn to the near collapse of the Schengen system of visa and passport free travel in Europe. Um, and that there was basically no agreement on resettling these people across the European Union, which then led uh, to Germany allegedly opening its borders for each and every one a large number of arrivals in Germany and some other, mostly northern states, um, Sweden, for instance, also Denmark, uh, but most prominently perhaps in Germany, where these people were initially welcomed, but then the mood turned sour quite quickly, uh, which contributed specifically in Germany to the transformation of Germany's AFD, um, allegedly conservative liberal Eurosceptic party that turned into a radical right populist party. That transformation was already underway in 2015, but it was really fueled uh, by the rising number of refugees arriving in Germany. Beyond Germany, um, immigration became again the most salient issue in many European countries. Uh, both in the south, but also in the north of the European Union and even in Central and Eastern Europe, where historically very few refugees had tried to settle. Uh, that was suddenly on, on the top of the political agenda. And of course, this is an important development or was an important development uh, because immigration and multiculturalism are the core issues of the populist radical right. More Generally, um, this renewed tensions within the European Union, adding to the bad blood that had been created by the Euro crisis. So again, it was the North against the South, but also the East against uh, the West. Uh, and the European Union became even more unpopular in many European countries than it had been before. This problem um, or rather this combination of problems is still not resolved. Um, see the latest developments in the European Union. You're all reading the newspapers and listening to the news. Um, you know that at the latest European summit, again, this was a very, very big and largely unresolved issue. And by and large, um, the parties of the populist radical right that exist in almost all European countries have benefited and are still benefiting from this um, development crisis, whatever you want to call it. My final example, um, starting late in 2019 or early in 2020, I, I really don't have to remind you because this is quite fresh in your memory. We had very recently a global health crisis that turned into an economic and political crisis uh, and was probably one of the biggest political crises in living memory, last not least because of its global 
scale. Um, the political consequences of COVID were many, uh, but I would like to focus obviously on the populist actors mostly, um, not exclusively, but in most countries, these were populist actors on the far right uh, who tried to minimize the risk that COVID posed to populations all across the globe, and on the other hand, tried to minimize um, the benefits of vaccinations and other measures to curb the spread of the pandemic. Um, what we have seen in the last four years was an unprecedented wave of mis and disinformation on a truly global scale, um, a large-scale populist mobilization, mostly around the world, but also because of COVID, mostly confined to the online sphere. So something very, very unusual. And if you try to draw a kind of bottom line on the, all of this and try to look who has benefited, you might find that the, the real um, payoff, if you wish, for populist actors has been limit. It has not been nil, uh, but it has not led to a wave of populist governments coming to power, at least not in what I have here called the global West, so Europe, North America, um, and so on. Quite contrary, um, for a time at least, it led to a um, surge in trust in experts and um, the established parties in, in many countries. Nonetheless, um, you might argue that COVID and the mobilization around COVID helped to build international populist networks. Um, it made quite a splash in social media. It helped populist actors to build a base on social media. And it also helped them to make a lot of money, uh, which they raked in in terms of, of contributions and donations and stuff like that. So... Um, if I try to summarize my thoughts on this um, first part of the story or on this first question, um, it would seem that all these crises mostly helped to fuel radical right-wing populism, not populism as such. It was, was specific. Uh, but in the case of the economic crisis, um, the left-wing populist uh, mobilization was not very durable. Whereas in the case of um, the so-called refugee crisis, and probably also in the case of the COVID crisis, it was clearly the radical right that benefited from these developments. And that brings me to a question. It's really just a question at this point. Uh, it made me wonder is this, if this is really about populism or more about right-wing radicalism, um, this link to crises. Let's turn to um, the final part of my talk, crises as a consequence of populism. Um, so populists bringing about crises by their decisions. Uh, my first example, Trump and Brexit, uh, 2016 was really um, a fascinating year for populism watches because um, in the UK, um, a campaign that had been running for decades and that was led by the right-wing media, but also by a far-right party, UKIP, and by the Eurosceptic wing of the Tory party succeeded in bringing Britain out of the European Union. So they succeeded first in having this referendum and second the referendum, although it was very close, it delivered a majority um, that was sufficient for bringing Britain out of the European Union, first time in the history of the European Union that a state actually left the bloc. And that was on our side of the Atlantic. On the other side of the Atlantic, a decade-long campaign, again, um, for the heart of the Republican Party brought um, right-wingers in a position to make Donald Trump the Republican nominee, who then won um, the presidency, although this was only possible because of the Electoral College. But nonetheless, um, the most radical wing of the Republican Party took control of the party and then of the whole country. And that was, um, as you will remember, also quite significant and crisis-like development. 
Um, the political consequences of this have been that um, on their side of the Atlantic Trump and on our side, the Brexiteers turned their respective parties, which were formerly mainstream parties or center-right parties, into what has been called radicalized mainstream parties, that is, mainstream parties that adopt policies, um, rhetoric, actors of the more radical right. And the upshot of this has been that liberal democratic institutions like parliament, like the judiciary, like the media, and even uh, the justice and security machinery have been seriously undermined because the actors at the top claim to have a mandate directly from the people that uh, gave them legitimacy to transform the political system. And that was what happened domestically, but of course it wasn't defined to domestic politics. Um, it also led to multiple attacks on liberal international institutions like the United um, Nations, for instance, or the European Union, uh, and many other um, international institutions like um, WHO, for instance, from which um, these actors withdrew or whose credibility they tried to undermine. Um, another major consequence of these developments has been, again, internal polarization and probably also um, a not particularly competent response to the COVID crisis in terms of um, the medical management, if you will. A second example uh, where populist actors have created crises is um, the European Union and its ongoing problem most prominently with Hungary and Poland. There are also other member states who could be deemed problematic. Uh, but I think Hungary and Poland are the most um, prominent cases. And again, it's about radicalized mainstream parties in Poland, law and order, who started out as um, a populist, but probably center-right party that quickly moved further to the right um, after coming to power and that actively tries to undermine the judiciary back home, uh, but also more general European Union principles and the rule of law at the European level. And in Hungary, Fidesz, a very similar but not identical story, obviously, um, who started out as a already populist liberal conservative party that then moved to the far right in 2010 and also happened to be quite corrupt. Um, both countries were quite often in tandem to block decisions by the European Union aimed at bringing them back in to the fold, uh, and they happily used the European Union as the evil external other um, that infringes on their national rights and forces them to adopt all this gender, queer, whatnot ideology. And I don't, I don't want to go there really. Um, but one of the reasons, um, especially in Hungary, why they are blaming the European Union for everything and anything is uh, that there are not really any internal elites left uh, against which they could mobilize because um, Fidesz is basically controlling um, the whole state. This creates um, multiple headaches for the European Union um, and has led to a situation where Hungary um, is a, a European Union member state um, in more or less good standing, uh, but can no longer be considered a full liberal democracy and is not considered uh, a full liberal democracy any longer by the European Parliament and by political scientists. And Poland is not doing um, that much better. Here you see a plot of the VDEM Liberal Democracy Index for Hungary starting in the mid-1990s and going till 2022. And you can see that the decline begins in the 2010s uh, and has now reached a point where by conventional standards, you would say, um, at least on this liberal subdimension, Hungary is no longer uh, a, a working, a functioning democracy. And if you look at the figures for Poland, you see it happens a little later and the decline is not quite as steep. Uh, Poland is still somewhere in the twilight zone between a full liberal democracy and a non-liberal democracy, uh, but the difference to Hungary is not that big anymore. 
Still, uh, both countries are inside the European Union and Poland in particular is really important for the pro-Ukrainian coalition. So well, what's what's the consequence of this? I don't know. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know what the long-term implications will be, but it's it looks to me like um, a pretty major European crisis brought about by those um, right-wing populist governments in Hungary and Poland. And again, um, the question, this is something that we might want to come back to in the Q&A. Again, um, this seems to be more about right-wing radicalism than about populism per se. It's, it's not that empty ideology, it's the content which makes this so uh, problematic. And that brings me already to um, my summary and my outlook. Um, first, a word, word of caution, I'm a West, Western Europeanist, um, so very much of what I told you is, is missing the bigger pictures. They're very um, interesting and um, perhaps scary developments in many other European countries that I haven't covered uh, a lot of things are going on in Africa and Asia. And there are literally whole libraries about populism in Latin America, where this has been um, a huge factor of political life for, you could probably say for centuries. The same goes for North American politics, uh, where populists emerged in the 19th century. And all this uh, has been neglected from my talk. So please, uh, please take that into consideration. Second, if I try to summarize my findings, I would like to highlight that one can have two compatible uh, but not identical definitions of crisis. So you could argue that there are two types of crisis. The first type or definition is focused on the system level where you uh, want to watch out for threats that um, challenge the system and might lead to a transformation of the system. Whereas the second type of crisis is none less, um, is no less real, uh, but here the focus is on citizens' perceptions of political and other developments. It's the, the sense or the feeling of crisis that is of import, importance here. Um, and both variants of crisis are closely linked to populism. That seems um, for sure. In Europe, at least, right-wing populism is much more relevant and successful than left-wing populism or centrist populism. Um, populists seem to benefit from real or hyped-up developments, mostly in the field of migration. And this is perhaps not at all surprising because this is so closely linked to their core ideology or their host ideology um, of nativism, if you wish. Um, interestingly, at least in my view, they could not benefit as much from COVID, at least in Western Europe, um, although we should keep in mind that they used COVID to build alliances, to spread their networks, and also to rake in money. My final point um, is that populists are not passive in this game. It's not just that they benefit from crises, it's also that they create crises um, in the first, in the system's uh, perspective sense of crisis for liberal democracy. And I think they're doing this intentionally, first because they benefit from it in terms of electoral support, but also because it aligns with their ideological goals. Uh, populists, at the end of the day, do not like liberal democracy. They want to create a reduced form of democracy. And so they have a very strong incentive to create crises. And they might be successful in the long run. You could argue that Hungary is a case where European Union member state has been successfully transformed. Um, Poland, not there yet. Uh, and many other European countries are in a similar situation where they face serious challenges by mostly right-wing populist actors that want to bring about this reduced illiberal type of democracy. You could also look at other examples outside of Europe, but that's beyond the scope of my talk. And 
if I'm honest with you, also uh, beyond my personal competence. So I would like to finish here. Thank you very much for your attention.